Uh, hi all, uh, welcome to the Twist uh, webinar. Uh, let's give it a minute or two uh, so that everyone can join the meeting and then we'll get started in a minute or so. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm Anand Bomakanti, uh, NGS Field Application Manager at Twist Bioscience. Uh, it gives me a great joy to welcome you all to the webinar, uh, Twist webinar, uh, Unveiling the Epigenetic Landscape, uh, Exploring NGS Methylation with Twist Bioscience. Uh, today, you will all have a great privilege of hearing from three of our esteemed speakers. Uh, Dr. David Martino from Telethon Kids Institute, Australia. Uh, Dr. Seong Cho Lee from Jininas, South Korea. And Dr. Wei Mei Ruan from Anchor DX Medical, uh, China. Uh, they'll all be sharing their valuable insights on their methylation research using TWIST bioscience, robust and effective target enrichment methods for, twist, uh, for epigenetic research. So before we get started into the uh, speaker sessions, I would like to go a few housekeeping rules. Um, uh, as usual, please ensure that all your lines are muted uh, during the webinar. Um, we'll be addressing all the questions at the end of the web, uh, presentations, and then you, you can feel free to uh, add your questions during the webinar in the QA box located at the bottom of your screen. And once the presentation is concluded, we, you know, because we immensely value your feedback, we kindly ask you to make uh, take a minute to complete the feedback survey. Uh, now, without any further uh, delay, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. David Martino. Uh, Dr. Martino is a biomedical research scientist trained in molecular biology, human immunology, and genomics. He currently leads the epigenetics uh, team at Telethon Kids Institute, and his lab is focused on understanding the links between child health development and molecular hallmarks of the epigenetic control. 
Uh, Dr. Martino's research program focuses on turning clinical samples into di digital genomes and conducting association studies so that they can detect genes and genetic markers associated with health and disease. Uh, Dr. Martino has published extensively on epigenetic mechanisms in allergy and asthma. Um, he also sits on the board of the uh, uh, one of the largest service providers, uh, Genomic Western Australia, and also is a part of steering committees uh, that looks over the roles of major Western Australia-based NGS projects. So without any further delay, uh, let's welcome Dr. Martino to start his presentation. Dr. Martino, uh, I'll hand it, over, hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Um, I will just uh, share my slides. Okay. So um, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm based in uh, Western Australia and I'm part of the Walian Respiratory Research Centre of Excellence. Um, Walian Wailagup is an indigenous term for place of healthy lungs. And we're a global epicentre for paediatric research. Uh, and today I'll be talking about a project looking at uh, prenatal risk factors for lung development and how we might conduct epigenomic studies to understand uh, how early life events really set the scene for future risk uh, for respiratory uh, morbidity. Well, I'd just like to start with this analogy. These two boys here are my nephews, Sammy and Raf. Um, they're about two years of age apart. They share about 50% of their genome, like all siblings do. Uh, and they grew up in the same household, they ate similar food, and, and during winter they experienced the same viral illnesses. But Sammy's respiratory uh, health is different to his brother's. Uh, when he gets a cold, it triggers wheezing episodes, which sometimes lead to uh, hospitalization. He's vulnerable to viral, viral inflammation, although he's too young to actually receive a formal diagnosis of asthma, he exhibits many of the features of a child on that trajectory. Um, and unfortunately, there really is nothing we can do about it right now. There's no practical advice that we can give to his parents. We're stuck in this scenario of wait and see if it develops into asthma before treatment is initiated. And unfortunately, Sammy, Sammy's not alone. Respiratory diseases are still uh, one of the major cause of disease uh, morbidity globally. These are a uh, burden of disease statistics globally around the world. Um, and among the pediatric population, um, it's one of the most frequent causes of hospitalizations. And so while we've had really substantial gains in asthma treatment, um, you can see from Sammy's story, we need to shift the focus towards disease prevention. And so that's one of the key areas we're working on is around biomarkers for early identification of respiratory vulnerability uh, and developing novel treatments that can prevent asthma from developing uh, in vulnerable children like Sammy. So um, epithelial vulnerability in children with asthma, our colleagues in the Walian Centre have done a lot of fantastic work characterizing respiratory vulnerability using nasal epithelial cell cultures uh, from asthmatic and healthy children. What I'm showing you here uh, is data from nasal epithelial scratch and wound repair assays showing that children with asthma have intrinsic deficits in their uh, respiratory epithelium cellular repair uh, and migration uh, capacity. So the team have been really successful in showing that there is a cellular phenotype here which can be studied in the lab uh, using respiratory nasal brushing cells that recapitulates intrinsic vulnerabilities of the airways. And what we want to understand is the nature and the origin of this vulnerable and epithelial endotype. When does it begin and what are the mechanisms? Unfortunately, the state of science is that we only have a really high level of understanding of how airway epithelial vulnerability arises and why it happens only in some children. What we know is that it involves complex inter interactions between the genome uh, and environmental risk factors that happen during very sensitive uh, periods of early development. Uh, and in fact, several of the asthma GWAS studies have identified that the risk variants are related to epithelial biology. So at a very basic level, 
Epithelial vulnerability seems to arise from gene environment interactions, possibly mediated through epigenetic mechanisms. So the aerial birth cohort, which I'd like to tell you about now, uh, was launched by us in 2018 to try and answer some of the key questions, uh, including um, whether the vulnerable epithelium is programmed during fetal life um, and whether we can leverage molecular profiling uh, studies to identify new biomarkers and targets for intervention. So the aerial birth cohort uh, is nested within the Origins Project, which is a birth cohort of 10,000 uh, families recruited during pregnancy and followed up until their offspring um, are five years of age. Um, so for the aerial study, we recruited 300 um, mother-infant pairs, uh, and we collected both nasal uh, respiratory samples and placental samples, uh, match placental samples, um, from each of the newborns. And we're monitoring viral exposures over the first year of life, uh, including the nasal microbiota and characterizing pathogens. During those infections, we're recording symptomatic illness. And beyond one year of age, uh, the children will be assessed for respiratory and allergic phenotypes. And we're hoping to extend the cohort out to school age to measure lung function. So what Ariel will allow us to do is to identify genes and pathways involved in the fetal programming of disease risk and follow those markers up over time to see how they're modified by viral and other exposures um, and how they relate to disease inception with the ultimate view that we can hopefully use these markers to identify high-risk kids early and recommend uh, strategies to build resilience in the respiratory epithelial tissue before it's too late. So the data I'd like to show you today pertains to a very specific question about whether the placental amnion tissue that we're collecting is useful for studying how gestational exposures can affect our respiratory epithelium development. So we've been working with the nasal respiratory tissue, as I mentioned, um, to characterize uh, respiratory vulnerability for some time now, but it's not always easy to collect this tissue from newborns we often need to wait several weeks after birth to collect it. Um, and by which time the epigenome is continually modified uh, by the colonizing microbiota and the environment. Now, um, the amniotic membrane is a fetal tissue, uh, which you can see here, uh, that is exposed to the gestational environment and it's rich in epithelial stem cells. They're known as amniotic epithelial cells that are recoverable from the lining of the inner membrane of the placenta. And these have got stem cell-like properties. So these cells can potentially provide a window into gestational events that impact uh, epithelial and stem cell development. Uh, and one of the key things we're interested in is whether we can identify signatures of disease risk that can be followed up in the mature respiratory tissues um, as children age. So we designed this proof of concept study within Ariel. Uh, we harvested uh, amniotic epithelial samples uh, from 88 newborns and um, matched nasal respiratory samples that were collected between two and six weeks of life. So every newborn had um, a matched pair of samples. In total, we had 176 samples that were collected and we're extracted, uh, we extracted DNA and RNA from the tissues, which we've used for methylation sequencing and transcriptomic analysis. And today I'm only presenting the data on DNA methylation, but our laboratory uh, lead, uh, Nina Crisoye, who's a, uh, an exceptional pair of hands uh, with NGS in the laboratory, built 176 libraries which was sequenced on the Nova Seq 6000 um, at two by 150 base pair on the S4 flow cell uh, using an NXP workflow. Uh, so in total, we generated at least 160 million reads uh, or sequences per sample uh, through our genomics research partner, Genomics WA. 
So we typically use microarrays for our large cohort DNA methylation studies, but we chose to use the TWIST human methylome panel for a few reasons for this study. One, uh, it doesn't involve uh, bisulfite conversion. It uses an enzymatic conversion. And that actually meant that we could get away with a lot lower DNA yields. Um, and that was important because we don't recover a lot of cells um, from the amni amniotic tissue, and most of it needed to go into the transcriptomic assay. Secondly, because of the nature of microarray data, which is fluorescent intensity, we wanted the quantitative sequencing reads uh, because of the greater sensitivity uh, around the extremes of the bimodal distribution that you get uh, with sequencing data, which gives us a greater sensitivity given that we knew we were looking uh, for small effects. And finally, the additional content of uh, the TWIST panel substantially expanded our search space, uh, allowing the flexibility to scale NGS workflows up to several hundred samples uh, at a similar cost without being completely buried in the data as if we, uh, we would have been if we'd gone whole genome. Uh, so developing the bioinformatic capacity did take some effort because uh, we hadn't worked with this particular data before. Uh, we processed the FASTQ files um, using the, the NFCore MethylSeq standardized um, bioinformatic pipeline that we've modified to include a Picard profiler tool. Uh, and that allowed us to collect metrics um, on the alignment files around coverage and uniformity of the sequencing assay and it's conveniently compiled into a multi-QC report. Um, and the process data were analyzed in our studio uh, using the BSSeq um, uh, bioinformatics package. Um, and the bioinformatics pipeline, um, we've, we've implemented this modified version of the pipeline in the next flow language, and we've made the, um, the repo, the repository publicly available to anyone who wants to use it. And we're happy to, to share our experience with that if anybody is interested in using that and reaching out. Um, so the bioinformatic pipeline was implemented on the high performance compute environment at the Pawsey Supercomputing Facility in Western Australia. Uh, all of this was tested and developed by Patricia, our bioinformatician. Um, and we, we received a lot of um, fantastic support from Anant and Adam and the team at Twist to help orientate our compass as we worked through the bioinformatics with this new data type. Okay, so looking at the Picard metrics, um, we had good coverage and uniformity. This is the fold 80 base penalty, which was between 1.2 and sort of 1.6, uh, which for these low diversity libraries is good. Um, the average sequencing statistics, um, when we compared the nasal samples and the amniotic samples um, was similar with more than 90% of the bases uh, that we'd sequenced were covered by at least uh, 30X. And here's just an example of the alignment files that we get from two randomly selected samples. This is the nasal and the amnion tissue across a gene here. Uh, so you can see we get quite a lot of coverage um, across these regions. Uh, the methylated reads are shown in red and the unmethylated reads are shown in blue. Uh, and you can see a good example here of a region where the levels of methylation are different across the different tissues. So looking now at the general features of the methylation landscape, we could see um, that um, tissue was the major source of variation in this data set, uh, with the amnion samples clustering differently to the nasal respiratory samples. Um, this is a PCA plot around gene promoters. What we can see here is the amnion clustered quite tightly, whereas quite a lot more variability in spread uh, in the nasal respiratory tissue, um, which likely reflects the effects of the colonizing microbiota uh, and environmental uh, effects as well, uh, given these samples were collected, um, you know, sort of up to six weeks of life post birth. Um, and um, Despite these differences, there are still a lot of similarities. This is the sort of distribution of reads around the transcriptional start site, distribution of methylated reads around the transcriptional start site, which was pretty similar between uh, nasal and amnion tissue. Uh, and when we looked at the CPG islands, um, we can see that um, CPG islands were similar between both tissues where we saw patterns of uh, fully unmethylated and methylated islands 
um, in similar frequency across the tissues. So using differential analysis, uh, we identified that there were about uh, 4,500 uh, differentially methylated regions or DMRs between the tissues, which is depicted here in the volcano plot. Uh, each point on the plot here uh, is a DMR with the size of the plot um, shown here. So we have a range of sizes of DMRs. Um, and um, on the x-axis, we can see the effect size of um, uh, loss or gain of methylation. Um, and we determined that about 20% of the genome uh, was significantly different uh, between the tissues. You can see an example of two of these uh, DMR plots here, um, where we see, for example, um, this is the level of DNA methylation in the nasal tissue. It's fully methylated, um, whereas in the amnion sample, um, we have uh, low levels of methylation um, across the gene body of this particular gene here. These are the individual replicates. So we can see here the difference in the methylation patterns that we get um, for a few of these um, DMRs that we're identifying. And so what we can do with this data is we can remove all of these tissue specific regions in the genome. And what you're left with is uh, the genomic regions where the methylation patterns are highly concordant uh, between the tissues. Uh, and so now we can limit our search space to within these regions, which is sort of the remaining 80% of the genome. And within this highly conserved fraction, you can see the correlation of methylation levels between amnion and nasal are highly correlated within this fraction of the genome. Within this, we identified 159 uh, genes that are uniquely expressed in lung tissue that are shown here in the heat map. Um, so these are... Uh, log2 transcript counts from 32 tissues taken from the GTEx uh, consortium database. Um, so th for this set of genes, which you can see is very um, unique to the lung, um, or they're, they're very unique to being involved in lung development, the methylation levels are highly concordant in both tissues. So here's an example of two of them here. This is a surfactant protein gene, um, which has uh, demonstrates intermediate levels of methylation uh, and here are three of the nasal and amnion replicates that show very similar methylation profiles over this region. Um, and this gene down the bottom here, SG, uh, SCGB3A1, is an epithelial specific gene regulating cell proliferation. And this is largely unmethylated uh, in both tissues. So what this means in practical terms is that the epithelial cells uh, the, from the amnion can be used to study how gestational exposures might disrupt DNA methylation at genes relevant to lung and epithelial development. And so as a proof of concept study, uh, we looked at two very well characterized um, gestational exposures that the epidemiology literature tells us increase the risk of developing asthma in the offspring. Uh, the first, first is maternal smoking, which we measured um, from urinary, urinary cotinine samples um, collected at 20 weeks of gestation. Um, we only had four individuals um, that of the ADH uh, that were smokers. Um, but um, we found that there, were, uh, there was a signature of 111 differentially methylated um, CPGs that uh, were clearly established very early in development. Um, because the methylation profile at these markers is very different, both in the amnion and the nasal tissue. So this must have been a programming event that has occurred um, very, very early in development. We also looked at maternal asthma, which is again a well-described um, risk factor uh, for offspring asthma risk. Uh, here we had nine mothers with asthma, uh, so slightly more, and we found uh, a signature of 17 um, differentially methylated CPGs that were again imprinted on both the amnion and the nasal tissue uh, within that conserved part of the epigenome. So these sample sizes here for these exposures are small, so it's really encouraging that we can see these effects uh, and likely we would see more associations with a larger sample size, but it means that we can confidently say these programming events occurred in gestation, uh, not postnatal life, and we can now track these signatures 
um, through time in the nasal respiratory samples as children get older to see how the early environment modifies these signatures and how they relate to the eventual development of respiratory disease. And finally, we mapped um, these individual signatures to, to genes uh, and the enrichment testing showed us that uh, from the, the maternal smoking CPGs, they were enriched with human phenotypes um, re related to increased inf uh, inflammatory responses and um, abnormality of the immune system, um, which is a feature of what we see in children who develop asthma, as well as terms related to um, uh, gastrointestinal epithelial development and viral responses. Um, and for maternal asthma, very interestingly, we saw uh, enrichment of uh, genes involved in um, wound repair, um, which very much recapitulates what we see in the epithelial cells. Um, we also see um, genes involved in uh, lung morphogenesis um, and tissue migration pathways, are very much uh, recapitulating what we see in the cellular phenotype of these children. So I'd just like to make a few acknowledgements here uh, for my research team, uh, in particular Nina Crusoye, who did all the NGS work for us in the lab, uh, and the aerial investigator team. In particular, I'd like to mention uh, Professor Stephen Stick, uh, who really um, has led the way with his team in um, conceptualizing the vulnerable epithelial hypothesis um, and was um, instrumental in setting up the aerial both birth cohort, but also Liz Starsevich, who helped with collecting the samples um, and managing the program. Patricia, who did the bioinformatics, um, as well as Thomas, um, who um, led the way in the scratch wound repair assays and the other investigators. I'd like to acknowledge our research funder, uh, National Health and Medical Research Institute in Australia, um, and our research partners at Twist Bioscience and Genomics WA. So just to summarize, Hopefully I've shown you that the amniotic tissue uh, is a promising surrogate um, for the nasal epithelium. It showed a high degree of concordance uh, in the non-tissue specific regions and may be a good accessible tissue for studying prenatal programming. Um, this conserved methylome region could hold the key for understanding how early gestational exposures influence lung development um, and how they influence amniotic and epithelial stem cells as a starting point for understanding how um, um, respiratory disease inception occurs. And finally, our proof of concept study may support uh, the idea that there's a possibility uh, for, uh, for biomarkers um, within the placental fraction for monitoring future disease risk. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, and I will end the screen share there. Thank you, Dr. Martino, for such a nice presentation. Um, so now uh, we can take a look at the some of the questions that kept coming in, but uh, I would request all the audience to start typing their questions so that uh, you know we can ask Dr. Martino and get the answer directly from him. Um, yeah. So one of the first questions that we had is, um, you know, what are the sample requirements for the amniotic fluid? Uh, you know, how, how how difficult is it to isolate the DNA from amniotic fluid and you know, is there any metal, maternal contamination and stuff uh, in that? Yeah. Um, so our team put quite a lot of work into developing the SOPs um, for this protocol. We're harvesting the cells from the internal lining of the um, uh, of the placenta uh, amniotic membrane. So we're not um, gathering the fluid, um, and those cells are on the fetal side. Um, so the protocol um, protects against contamination from uh, maternal cells as well. Um, it is fairly difficult and labour intensive. Um, in terms of the specific yield of DNA, um, I don't have an, an easy answer for that right now because uh, we did have a sample processing team for that. Um, but um, we'd be happy to share the protocol if people are interested. Uh, the second question is probably associated with that as well. Can, can you extend the same assay or start using circulating fe fetal cells for, you know, kind of analyzing this data or, you know, start looking into the data from that perspective, Dr. Martinian? 
Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I think cell-free DNA methylation is, is, is a really fascinating area. Um, certainly there's utility for looking at inflammatory placental con conditions that way. Uh, so things like chorioamniotitis, uh, um, which can be associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, you would expect there to be DNA shedding from the inflammatory process there, um, and that circulating um, DNA may be recoverable. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any specific studies looking at circulating feed, fetal DNA methylation for asthma. Um, I think that is a really interesting concept. So thank you for the question. Um, and um, certainly something we should consider as a follow-on. Um, we have one more question. Uh, so does the kit that you use discriminate between 5MC and 5HMC? Uh, if not, do you think being able to distinguish the two types of methylations would lead to a better biomarkers? Yeah, so the enzymatic process, um, and actually, Ananthi might be able to help me out with this question yourself. Um, I, I, I believe um, the, um, so you, you can recover meth CPG methylation and non-CPG methylation. Right. You cannot use a hydroxymethylation using this kit. Um, yeah. Is there anything yeah, you want to add to that? Right. At this current uh, state, the kit can't differentiate between 5MC and 5HMC, but I think uh, NEB is coming up with a kit that can that will be able to do this. But I think with the current modification, it should it, it does not differentiate between both of them. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the samples that we're using, um, hydroxymethylation um, or non-CPG methylation um, wasn't particularly of interest to us because it's uh, not um, uh, not the major source of methylation in the tissues we're interested in, but certainly if we were looking at neuronal tissue or something like that, um, that information is recoverable. Um, we have, and I haven't presented today, uh, as part of the, um, the methylseq pipeline, um, we can call genotypes um, from the methylation data, um, and we have done that, and we're working our way through the VCF files now. Um, we are interested in looking at um, the frequency of known uh, asthma genetic variants in our population. Um, so there is a value add um, for genotypes as well. Uh, I think we have one more last question before in the interest of time, and we'll try to answer remaining questions uh, after the seminar. Uh, so the, the question is, you know, do you suggest any optimizations with the uh, methylation pipelines that you're currently currently using? I know you, you mentioned that you started sharing it on a GitHub for everyone to use. And the associated thing is, you know, when you're doing clustering analysis, how are you actually narrowing down on which methylation CPG sites you want to use for the clustering of the you know, amniotic and uh, the normal tissue samples? And, you know, how, how do you take the decision? Uh, sure. Um, so with the first question, um, <clears throat> there was a bit of optimizing that we needed to do to get the pipeline to run efficiently on the HPC compute. Um, and um, again, we're happy to share our experience with that. So that's really around optimizing the job scheduler and wall times for the particular task. We are, um, we've made the pipeline uh, available at the DOI link that I shared. Um, yeah. And if anybody would like that, please get in contact with um, Anance um, and um, we'd be happy to share that. Um, that will be published as well in the, um, the Journal of um, um, open source bioinformatics, I think, as well. So there is a manuscript being prepared, which will hopefully pr provide more details to people. With the second question um, around clustering analysis, um, yeah, you're right. The um, size of the data set um, is around 7 million CPGs. So clustering the whole genome um, is computationally expensive. What we do is we just subset the genome down into, into important regulatory regions. So we look at gene promoters, we look at gene enhancers, we look at CPG islands, and we run all our clustering on those um, separately. Um, and, um, and we check to see consistency across those regions. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Martino. Uh, it was really nice. And thanks a lot for answering all the questions. Um, so we'll, in the interest of time, we'll move to the next speaker.
So next, I'm very excited to introduce um, uh, our second speaker, Dr. Seong Cho Lee. Um, he, uh, Dr. Lee, obtained his PhD from in plant molecular biology from University of California, Riverside, and did his postdoctoral studies in DNA methylation at Cold Spring Harbor uh, Laboratory. Uh, currently, Dr. Lee is the principal scientist at Jininas, uh, South Korea. And he has recently published uh, on topics including on chromatin remodeling and biomarker discovery for the cancer detection using liquid biopsy. So let us welcome Dr. Lee to start his presentation. Uh, Dr. Lee, please uh, take over. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for introduction and uh, having me here. So I share my slide. Right. Uh, our company actually uh, uh, focus on the developing uh, uh, genomics tools and also uh, cancer vaccine and uh, including some uh, single cell analysis. But I will talk about mostly about uh, methylome analysis, so what we did, uh, um, and then share some other insights about it. So first, um, so every cell has a, a, a special their signature, uh, which can be shown by DNA methylation patterns. As you, as you can see here, the uh, figures and uh, immune cells, uh, they can be uh, differentiated into different types, and then they all have the, a unique uh, uh, DNA methylation patterns, and that can be uh, explained by the methylome. And also, uh, that uh, methylation patterns are uh, uh, actually important to reprogram the cell uh, determination. So to explain so how the DNA methylation happens, and you can see the DNMT1, which is a CG method transfer, uh, interacts with other transcription factors or chromatin proteins. And then they, uh, so each cell types, they have uh, some signal transcription of signal and epigenetics uh, signaling, and they can make a unique DNA methylation patterns. Usually happens uh, during a cell cycle uh, for the maintenance of DNA methylation. So uh, recently the DNMT1 interaction with other chromatin neurodynamic DNA proteins were published and included the uh, this is a uh, uh, chromatin remodeling protein and the uh, DNA interactions is, um, published the last year, I uh, joined. And uh, so the conclusion is the DNA method transferages and chromatin remodeling shape the epigenetic landscape for each cell type. So uh, let me talk about some uh, connection to uh, the cancer um, uh, detection. So, for example, here are uh, cancer patients. They have the tumors uh, in different organs, uh, uh, such as uh, lung and uh, uh, colorectal cancer. And what happens here is the cancer cells, they uh, after dying and they release uh, the DNA uh, by apoptosis or necrosis. And uh, this DNA molecule actually um, migrate to uh, in a blood vessel, and so that we can detect the uh, circulating tumor DNA uh, by uh, isolating uh, ctDNA from plasma fraction. And what you can do is uh, you can uh, uh, analyze mutations and copy number variations and gene fusions, and also you can analyze DNA methylation patterns using this technology. So recently, uh, I think the, this is the, one of the best um, um, study of what's done by Grail, comp another company, and they evaluated the uh, different uh, biomarkers or analysis from the ctDNA, and then they concluded that the uh, methylation parents uh, gives the high, highest sensitivity to detect the cancer uh, as compared to other uh, fragment lengths or um, mutations or some uh, fusion uh, uh, structural variations. So I, I, I want to focus, uh, uh, emphasize the how DNA methylation parents can give uh, inform informative uh, data to us uh, for cancer detection. 
So here are some limitations to uh, analyze ctDNA. So the first is the detection sensitivity is pretty low because the, usually in plasma, the ctDNA uh, only present to one to 10%. And secondly, the uh, uh, standard DNA methylation analysis they used uh, bisulfide cytosine conversion. Sometimes the bisulfide treatment can degrade the DNA. So the uh, sometimes it, uh, it, uh, uh, difficult to get the high coverage for ctDNA. And uh, so uh, one thing that the, uh, the DNA methylation itself has some limitation. Uh, Maybe you have to know though is uh, so many mutations gives very direct uh, the information for uh, functionality of genes, but the uh, epigenetic alterations only covers the uh, uh, cell differentiation and uh, gene expression information. Uh, so sometimes it cannot be uh, it cannot give the, the companion diagnostics for me. Uh, anyway, so. About these limitations, we can solve these uh, solutions. Uh, you have some solutions, for example, enzymatic based uh, conversion method, and then uh, the small panel size can give uh, high coverage so that we can detect the cancer with the high, uh, higher sensitivity with uh, low DNA input. So, uh, so enzymatic conversion uh, is uh, slightly different from the bisulfide conversion uh, for the uh, visual about the, the processes are very different. The bisulfide conversion included the uh, chemical treatments and which is uh, sometimes uh, uh, degrading DNA and then the optimization is uh, sometimes uh, required. And for enzymatic modification of cytosine as uh, two steps. So one is a TET2 oxidation in uh, uh, step, and then the second is apoblack enzyme uh, converted the uh, uh, unmethylated sequence to version. And then finally, the sequencing information you get is uh, actually uh, altered sequences as a uh, T. So enzymatic conversion method has a, a, a advantages um, uh, in that uh, it has a, it provides more uh, stable DNA fragment, and also the uh, twist. I think the uh, uh, methylon panels provide higher coverage for CPGs for uh, as compared to other uh, microRNA method. So and also NGS method uh, included some uh, uh, more uh, flexible uh, options uh, you can take. So for uh, circulated tumor DNA methylation analysis, uh, you, you have to consider that uh, normal plasma CFDNA usually don't uh, include uh, tumors, um, circulated tumor DNA. So what uh, people do is uh, this, uh, um, uh, analyze what's the feature of a uh, CPG uh, methylation uh, as compared to the normal DNA. So, that uh, if you see and anything is unmethylated from uh, the same loci, it usually has to be methylated, and then you can call it like unmethylated or hypomethylated uh, um, fragment. And uh, you you can calculate the each CPG level, and then you can sometimes combine more uh, methylation level, or you can do some uh, uh, pattern. Uh, a methylated pattern as a, a part of a chain or some other method um, to to find out that this fragment actually came from uh, tumor one. So, uh, so microRNA sometimes it covers only single um, CPG island, but uh, uh, you, the sequencing method is uh, has sometimes a good to know where the this uh, CPG positions are co-methylated one. So in our hand, the uh, methylation pat uh, patterns are sometimes uh, as a single CPG, it doesn't give a good uh, uh, power performance. But it, as you uh, change, uh, checking the co-methylated pairs and then you can get a better uh, performance for detecting cancer. And another independent study actually uh, uh, agree with that. So we can see that uh, this is a targeted 
bisulfide is sponsoring, but anyway, the hypercommetylated weed can be very informative to give us um, um, whether this um, cancer uh, tumor DNA came from or not. So for our study, we uh, used the 85 megabase uh, panel for macro discovery from tissue. So we compare normal tissue to uh, cancer tissue and uh, find out what uh, CPG regions are uh, differentially methylated. And then we define the DMRs and then narrow down the what uh, markers are really important. And then we designed the custom panels uh, from twist, and then we uh, we get sometimes we make the multi uh, cancer panel, but we also can make a, a cancer specific panel from using this. And then after we get the data from ctDNA uh, uh, methylome, and then we can also do some of, of more refined uh, biomarker discovery using the machine learning algorithm. So here's a one example. The, you can also uh, detect the multi-cancer in one uh, custom panel. And this is actually uh, tissue data, but uh, some different types of uh, uh, cancer, you, you can have the unique uh, um, methylation pairs. And um, you, uh, using methylone panels, you can discover these panels, but uh, to increase the maybe sensitivity, you have to uh, focus on maybe some of the biomarkers. Uh, and in some cases, uh, for colorectal cancer and gastric cancer, you have uh, some overlapping uh, by, uh, methylation markers. So uh, to get to know the, the really uh, the origin of the tumor, you, you have to know the, uh, the uh, refine the other biomarkers to get the uh, cancer type specific methylation patterns. And here's another more focused study for uh, prostate cancer. So what we did is uh, compare the prostate cancer to uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is not cancer, but similar, uh, but has some similar symptoms to uh, prostate cancer. So to compare, uh, to distinguish these uh, uh, two types of disease, we actually get the uh, methylation patterns from two different biopsy. So this is a tissue data. So here is a, the black bar uh, indicated the uh, BPH and then uh, the red bar indicate uh, uh, so, uh, on the, the heat map. Um, sorry. You can see the, the prostate cancer samples and then different methylation patterns uh, are shown. And as you can see in PCA blood, we can distinguish the BPH and PCA prostate cancer uh, samples uh, using these methylation uh, markers. And then the, the age uh, the value is very precise. And we know that uh, one markers can uh, discriminate these two types of disease. And further, we uh, actually studied uh, what the difference between the early prostate cancer and the late prostate cancer, advanced late, uh, prostate cancer. And we defined the uh, 600 uh, uh, CPG size, and then it gives us a very clear uh, 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 distinction between the two uh, early uh, prostate cancer and the late uh, prostate cancer. And then, as you can see, this is the BPH and the early. PCA, and then this is advanced PCA shown by uh, this uh, methylation data. And we noticed that this, uh, this is, uh, interestingly, the CPG levels are uh, give us a more, more uh, uh, high, uh, better informative biomarkers uh, as compared to DMRs. So as you can see here, though, mostly the CPG level is more important to discriminate to different uh, Disease. And then when you look at the, what where the CPG uh, differential methylation happens, and then actually many regions actually include uh, also gene body. And we know that the promoter regions uh, uh, have the, when they have the differential methylation, it can connect, uh, lead to the differential gene expression. So we, what we see is uh, some uh, cancer related and transcriptional 
regulation have to insert uh, from the early cancer and the late cancer. And for uh, circulated DNA methylation analysis, we uh, designed the custom panel, and then you can actually select some uh, uh, CPG visions, and then uh, after designing uh, probes from twist, you can get the high coverage. And in some cases, uh, because of the biological sample, you, you can get uh, uh, less coverage, but we normally use uh, uh, more than 300x for uh, circulating tumor uh, DNA method. So uh, for the uh, colorectal cancer case, uh, we have uh, the methyl methylation parent, and then uh, uh, you normally know it's known the colorectal cancer uh, is uh, easy to detect using relatively easy to detect using uh, uh, CT DNA analysis, and then we also get uh, the same. Uh, uh, on the, uh, results. So the from the stage one to stage four, we can uh, relatively precisely uh, detect the colorectal cancer from the blood samples and more precisely uh, uh, plasma samples. So today's uh, summary is enzyme-based conver uh, conversion and hybridization based capture method uh, enables to analyze uh, cell-free DNA methylation data with high coverage depth. And uh, co-methylation uh, parents can be very uh, effectively used to uh, remove the noise uh, present in the safe DNA methylation profile in case uh, sometimes there are, we notice that there are varies in uh, sequence coverage itself in from cell-free DNA. And custom designs of methylistic panels can guide the selection of important marker cells from tissue genome DNA to cell-free DNA level. And when you want, especially you want to have the high coverage from uh, safely DNA method load, and then a the smaller panel is uh, uh, advantageous. And overall twist by sensor targeted panels can provide high accuracy and performance for multi cancer detection and other uh, methylation studies. Thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, such a nice presentation. Uh, we have a few fresh questions that are coming in. Uh, so one of the first questions that uh, we have is, uh, so what makes certain markers better for methylation detection compared to the other one? And so we have seen that you have selected around 600 methylation targets for differentiating uh, the cancers, right? So what, what, what criteria do you take into consideration for selecting these markers? So uh, we usually uh, use a machine learning uh, algorithm to and some consider the uh, importance of markers, uh, selection of markers. And uh, the reason is, uh, uh, first, I think uh, two points are important. One is sometimes some markers very uh, gives very uh, high coverage. So every uh, patient one, um, uh, pay, uh, have uh, some level of uh, up regulation or uh, uh, down regulation of methylation. But sometimes the degree is very weak. And then there are some other types of markers. It has to be, uh, if you see the uh, hypermethylation from cancer patient, and then that's really uh, true. Uh, and But uh, sometimes it doesn't cover all every uh, cancer patient. So I think the combined two cases uh, gives more, uh, gives better uh, sensitivity and specificity. So hope I, I can ex I explain that well over this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so we have seen that you actually started with a bigger uh, 85 MB, the twist human methylome, and then finally you decided to move on to the smaller 5 MB panel, right, for with a selected set of methylation sets. So uh, even though you in your data you showed that the correlation was really good, you know, what kind of major differences did you observe when you moved from larger panels to smaller panels for your research? Uh yeah, so uh, like the maybe the first answer actually connected that to that point, and we think uh, the some mark uh, DNA fragments they don't exist 
very much in uh, uh, some patient's level. So if we really need uh, the high sensitivity from the, the low input DNA, and in that case, we have to have the smaller panel and the high coverage, and then that's our advantages. But we have seen other studies, for example, use a whole genome by uh, methylomes, and then, uh, you know, the I think it, it's also connected to some companies' purpose. Research purpose may be uh, looking at the more broader uh, landscape of uh, methylome, maybe our advantages, but if you really want to uh, cut down the cost for diagnosis and or dia uh, diagnosis or uh, if you want to make it uh, commercialized and then maybe the smaller panel is advantageous and then maybe it, it gives us a better, uh, more robust data, yeah, I think, yeah. And we have one more question, uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, so uh, with, with the NEV kit, with, with CFDNA, right, what, what were the lower limitations that you felt uh, you know, with, with the starting amount of CFDNA, you know, what, what, what was a good starting point and um, what were the limitations for the uh, uh, amount of CFDNA that was used for the uh, assays? So uh, I think the stable answer is the 20 nanogram input is uh, usually uh, good for us, but it sometimes it varies whether the who is doing this experiment, but we actually tested also the 15 nanogram and actually it worked for us. Uh, so, but I think the uh, yeah, borderline is a 20 nanogram should be good. And then, uh, but if you have a more DNA and then maybe it will give a more complexity of uh, DNA. So it can be uh, more, but something it usually depends on the clinical setup. Uh, you, you don't want to draw too much blood from the patient. So that, that's the, I think, the point. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Lee. I think we got most of the questions uh, answered up here. Um, and we'll move to our next speaker. Uh, and once again, thanks a lot for such a good presentation, Dr. Lee. Uh, just a quick request to the uh, audience up here. Please do uh, uh, keep sending your questions as the seminar is progressing so that we can ask the uh, uh, speakers. Thank you. So moving on to our third speaker today, um, we have uh, Dr. Wei Mei Ruan, uh, Senior Director of R&D from Anchor DX Medical, uh, China. Uh, Dr. L uh, Ruan specializes in trans you know, transitioning research prototypes to in vitro diagnostics for cancer, and she spearheads the IBD design control and product development initiatives. Uh, Dr. Ruan Lur um, actually led to a successful development of Anchor DX Uri Fine Bladder Cancer Assay, an IBD test that has been approved by NMPA and is also designated as a US FDA breakthrough device. Um, Dr. Ruan has a PhD from NUS Singapore, and also uh, she has she did her postdoctoral work at A Star Singapore. And Dr. Ruan is an accomplished expert in the field. Uh, so, without much delay, I'll uh, welcome Dr. Ruan to start her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ruan. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. So, um, just share my uh, things. Um. Okay, um, so today I will talk about um, the DNA methylation based liquid biopsy for multi cancer detection. So, why multi cancer detection is important? Um, let's look at some of the statistics uh, in China. So, um, China actually has a relatively high incidence um, and mortality rates as compared to other countries in the world. So, it accounts for 39% of the new cases in the digestive system in the world and accounts for 43% uh, 43 of the cancer death um, as compared to other countries in the world. And um, the four cancers in the digestive system also accounts for nearly one third of, of the incidence uh, of all cancer incidents in China and nearly one half of the cancer death uh, of all cancer in China. So it is a very heavy um, burden in China. So how are we going to alleviate the problem? So we know that early detection is very important 
and the five years survival rates um, in the four cancers um, in localized tumor, uh, you can see is significantly higher uh, than those in metastatic uh, uh, tumors. And if we uh, compare the patient's five years uh, survival rate in China as versus in Japan, we will see that there's a significantly high um, five years survival rate in Japan, particularly in gastric cancer and colorectal cancer in Japan as compared to China. This is because in Japan, there will be national-wide um, screening program for these two types of cancer, and they have a relatively high early detection rates. Um, so how about, um, so how about China is currently doing for these four cancers? So actually China has published um, its guidelines for screening early detection and treatment um, for the all, all, all of the four cancer types. And um, but actually, but unfortunately, there's no national screening scheme yet um, for the four cancers. And here is some of the information that are taken from the guidelines. And we will see that um, actually for the four cancer types, except for the liver cancer, we will have a very similar uh, recommended uh, screen age. And um, we can also see that actually the high risk population for all the four cancers, they are sometimes overlap. So this means that actually uh, we will have a relatively universe um, intended use population for all the four cancers. Um, but you can see that um, for the current um, guidelines, we, we will see that the screen uh, frequencies for the four cancer are vary a lot uh, from every six months to as long as uh, every 10 years, depends on uh, different recommended approaches. And the approaches um, that recommended by the guidelines, um, they also have limitations. So for example, for colonoscopy, it, it is invasive. And um, for those, um, um, for example, uh, for the sponge cytology, it will require expertise and it has limited accessibilities. And um, for some of the tests like fit, it will have limited um, uh, sensitivities. And um, because of all these um, limitations and factors, we will see that actually the participation rate uh, for screening of these cancers is not uh, very high. So um, we are thinking about if we have a single test uh, for simultaneously detection of the four um, types of cancer, uh, because they have a relatively uh, universe intended use population and it will more or less um, increase the patient and compliant rate and it will increase the uh, rate um, for the um, screening patients. So how about we combine the current screening tests um, for the multi-detection um, systems? So for example, um, a, a 65 year old male with a chronic hepatitis disease and a smoking history uh, will make him eligible uh, for the four cancer screening uh, because he falls into the high risk population criteria. And if he uh, went through all the four uh, screening tests, then uh, he would have 3% of the false positive rate uh, from the gastroscopy screening, 10% from the FIT test. 16% um, from the liver cancer screening and 16 and 6.3% 6 from the sponge cytology. And at the end, uh, he will end up to have as high as 31.3% of the false positive rate. So this uh, means that actually um, combining the current screening test is not um, cost effective for the multi-cancer detection. And we may need a single um, test with a lower false positive rate uh, for the cost effective screening of the four cancers. Um, so here is our proposed intended use population and screening mod modalities. So we will use questionnaire to identify the high risk population and um, this uh, population will then uh, go through the liquid biopsy multi uh, for the multi-cancer detection in digestive systems and if the test is positive, then the patient can follow up with recommended um, screening frequency. And if the test is positive, and then the patient can go through um, endoscopy or ultrasound plus AFP testing. Um, 
as indicated by the tissue of origin prediction from the test results. And um, if the follow-up test is positive, then we have a confirmed diagnosis. If not, then they can follow up with standard workouts if, if there's um, any of the alarm symptoms shows up. And then next, we, we also check um, what techniques would be the most appropriate one um, for uh, development of the uh, multi-cancer detection system in terms of um, the capability of tissue of origin and cost accuracy, the capability of early detection, accessibility, invasiveness, and um, patient compliance. And uh, currently, uh, technology available, including imaging like ultrasound, um, pass CT, um, endoscopy like gastroscopy, colonoscopy, the protein test like AFP, CA19, DNA methylation test like the one that we developed called GINET, uh, or a somatic mutation or CMV like um, cancer sick uh, from exact science. And um, by checking all the aspects, um, we actually find that um, using DNA methylation as the biomarker for development of these types of tests are relatively um, more superior because um, it will enable you to have a, a good accuracy on tissue of origin prediction and the cost is affordable and um, it will also have a good uh, overall accuracy and it can also enable the detection of a uh, curable on tumors, um, which means it uh, is the stage one to three tumors. And um, because it is a rock drawn test, so it would have good uh, patient compliance and good accessibility. Um, so that's why we use um, DNA methylation for development of the tests. And um, next then uh, we would uh, see how the how to solve the key technical challenges uh, before the test can be used uh, for clinical usage. So the first technical challenge is that, is that uh, how we can uh, detect the trace signals derived from the early tumor in plasma. So um, Anchor DX has, uh, has developed its own ultra-sensitive uh, library prep, uh, platform. So it is uh, based on the single strand uh, library preparation. This will take into account of the DNA fragmented and the single strand generated from the bisulfite conversion. So we also incorporate the UMI barcoding into the library prep system so that um, the, the library prep will uh, make sure that uh, each of the um, single stranded DNA and the fragmented DNA can be ligated and converted into, um, into, the, um, into the library. So um, based on this platform, then um, we can we can detect the DNA um, as uh, has a, as low as a DNA input down to one nanogram, and we have a SALOD that is sensitive enough to detect uh, this trace signal. And it, and in addition um, to our library prep um, platforms, we also collaborate um, to, with um, Trispel Science to optimize the probe design for the efficient target uh, capturing and enrichment. So um, here I have so um, just a preliminary result um, from um, the testing um, of um, some of the markers that are using the TRIS uh, capture uh, panel, TRIS uh, panel. And uh, you can see that um, there's two um, different um, color of, of, the, um, of, of the greenness. Uh, it it uh, represents the two batches of the uh, capture panels uh, with different lots. And we will see that uh, they are actually clustering uh, for the same samples. And we will see that uh, from the two lots of the uh, panels, the signal is very consistent. And the second uh, technical uh, challenge is that uh, we need to identify the cancer specific signatures and also a good marker for the tissue of origin prediction. So for doing that, uh, we actually develop a large scale in-house uh, tissue and plasma sample DNA methylation database. So um, this database, um, it will cover, so the tissue database will cover 9 million uh, CPG islands and over 50% of the sample are from early stage tumors. And the plasma sample, um, they will cover multiple cancer types 
um, not limited to the one that uh, we use in the digestive system, also including lung cancer, breast cancer, um, and also renal cancer and bladder cancer, and also included uh, the healthy patient, uh, the healthy population, and the corresponding benign disease to ensure clinical um, specificities. And when we identify the markers, we also compare the signals um, between the tissue and the plasma. And the third technical challenge um, would be the most important one to just make sure that um, the assay that we are developing, um, they would um, be sufficiently validated in the real world. So um, for this um, one, so we also have uh, experience in developing um, successfully product, uh, products that has been currently used um, um, in clinic. So the, the first one is the pharmacy class, it is a liquid biopsy test um, to identify malignant uh, lung nodule from the uh, benign lung nodule. So it is recommended by the early uh, lung cancer um, detection by the society. And it has been validated uh, by the Project Thunder, which is a 10,000 cases multi-cancer perspective clinical study. So this test would have a very high um, accuracy and it has that it's battery um, sensitivity of over 95% in even detecting um, small nodules. And um, the performance is superior um, the opacity, the myoclinic model, and the VA model. The second product um, that has been um, successfully developed is um, Urefine. So um, over now, it has accumulated 10,000 real world cases. Um, it has been um, designated um, by the United States FDA breakthrough device, and it also has been approved by the NMPA um, as class three IVD uh, device. So next, I will talk about um, the study design for GINET development. So we have three stages of development. The first one is for market discovery. So we use um, 663 samples. Um, to identify the um, marker for um, cancer detection and also for tissue of origin prediction. So we divided um, the cohort into the chain and test set and the validation set. And for chain and test set, we use, uh, we use the feature uh, selection and also some um, uh, criteria to identify the, the, the markers and then we validated the markers in the validation set. And uh, with the identified marker, then we use um, 800 samples um, for model development and validation. And again, we divided the um, cohort into chain and test set and the validation set. And uh, we will validate um, its performance using the validation set. And uh, we also have stage three, which is the independent uh, validation ongoing. Uh, we are expecting to uh, have over 1,015 uh, one 1,500 samples um, to uh, validate um, the GINET performance before um, we are expecting to launch an FDT. Um, so here is the key performance um, for the GINET. Um, so the prevalence uh, for the PPV and MPV are calculated um, based on the uh, published data uh, to be 0 0.91 uh, um, prevalence for the four cancers. And with that prevalence, we will have 33.9% uh, for the uh, positive prediction value and 99.7% of the negative prediction values. And this assay will have 4.9% false positive rate. So as compared to the um, one that uh, we previously saw that uh, for just combining individual tests, um, it will have 30 uh, one percent of the false positive rate, so this one is much more, uh, lower. And then um for uh, for treatable tumors, uh, which means the stage one and three tumors, the sensitivity is sixty six percent, and we also have an accuracy for tissue of origin prediction of eighty four percent. So here are the um detection sensitivity for the four types of um, uh, cancers um in the validation. Set and uh, we will see that uh, for all the four cancers, we will see the sensitivity are uh, gradually increase uh, uh, along with the stages. And um, 
the accuracy for the tissue of origin prediction, we will see a relatively high um, tissue of origin prediction uh, with esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, and liver cancer, but uh, we have relatively low um, tissue of origin prediction uh, for colorectal cancers. And um, we also comparing our, our performance um, to the currently um, available um, similar uh, products. Um, um, they are all uh, uh, US FDA uh, breakthrough um, device. Um, so um, Gary is from US and Kansas City is also from US, OSD is from China. So um, if we comparing the sensitivity and specificity, we will see that we have a compatible sensitivity uh, specificity. And at the same time, we have a relatively um, high specificity. And as for um, tissue of origin prediction um, for top one of origin, uh, we also have a comparable uh, accuracies. And in terms of um, sensitivity of stage one to three tumors, um, with um, with comparable um, uh, validation test cases, um, we also see a very um, similar sensitivities um, um, as compared to the other uh, three products. So um, here is um, um, the end of uh, my presentation. So uh, it is an application and a showcase about the uh, uh, multi-cancer detection um, project uh, that we are having. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ruan. Such a you know enlightening presentation up there. Uh, we have a few questions that uh, came in. Um, so the first question was: um, uh, uh, You're using bisulfite-based uh, method for the library preparation, right? So do you think uh, the assay will still be valid? You know, will uh, be uh, as efficient if we use enzymatic method uh, instead of the bisulfite method for preparing the libraries up here? Um, actually, uh, we did uh, comparing the enzymatic um, conversion um, to bisulfite conversion and to our hand. Um, so um, to be honest, um, the enzymatic um, conversion, they will uh, cause less uh, DNA uh, damage. Um, but uh, uh, because, um, because actually our library prep, uh, platform uh, it it it's already taken into account of, of this uh, DNA damage and the fragmentation uh, uh, because for the ligation it either as long as it's single strands it will be ligated. So um, what we are seeing is that uh, for enzymatic um, conversion uh, the the conversion is uh, is milder, um, but it also will results in some of the false positive way because um the conversion efficiency it may not um be as high as the bisulfite conversion so um it it really um depends on uh, what requirement uh, your product is is needed so as far as uh, what we are having now it is still okay yeah. Uh, just just to extend that same thing, right? So it looks like the false positives play a pretty important role in your assay. So how do these false positives change from, because your assay is as sensitive, you know, it, it is sensitive for even one nanogram of DNA, uh, of circulating tumor DNA, right? So do the false positives decrease or increase based upon the amount of input material that you're using, uh, Dr. Ruan? Um, so um, it, it, I think it would be um, two separate concepts. So the uh, one that I'm showing you is actually the uh, technical aspect uh, of the assay. So uh, what we are doing, we, we do a titration uh, of different DNA inputs and uh, one nanogram we still um, would be able to detect um, the signals. Um, but as for uh, calling as a uh, positive result or negative result, it would relate it to the clinical cut off um, of our of our assay. So um, um the the input would uh reflecting the technical um, LODs, but the clinical 
um, cut off uh, whether to determine the test is positive or negative, it would be it would be way much above the LOD detection. So um um so it it would be two different um concepts and and um as we know uh, because uh when we are taking real samples it would not uh like uh that you have a constant uh, DNA input. So uh, by these aspects, uh, so far, the cases that uh, we are looking at, we don't see like a significant increase with uh, lower inputs uh, uh, as compared to higher inputs in, in our callings. Yeah, and as you may know, the different, uh, the, the DNA input, uh, the DNA yields actually uh, for CFDNA, it may be different even in different populations. For example, in healthy population and in uh, cancerous population, is uh, it's not always the same. So we must make sure that at different input, at least at the range that we have recommended, you will have a um, similar performance uh, in terms of sensitivities and specificities. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks, Dr. Ron, for the explanation up there. So the other question that we have is in the, uh, when you're validating your model, you have taken a set of 400 patients, right? Can you uh, explain a little bit more, you know, what kind of considerations you have taken for the training set, you know, types of cancer, stages of cancer, and how are all these equated for determining the training sets? Um, yeah, for, um, so actually uh, for the, so actually for the training sets, uh, it has, um, it has two strategies. So the one that we are using, um, we are actually taking relatively equal part of each types of cancers as long as it's corresponding um, benign disease and uh, as also uh, for healthy uh, populations. Um, for so doing that, uh, we try to avoid um, the bias that may cause uh, because of like um different sample size because you know um, for different performance for statistical analysis you require minimum um, sample size um so we just to make sure that um the the model that we are developing it is not because of bias from different sample size but um after the model development we do consider the actual problems uh, when we are using um, this assay in the real world which means that uh, you will see actually um, for different types of cancers, they have uh, um, they have different patterns and how this would affect uh, or, or how the performance will project when you're um, applying this model to the real world. So we still um, lacking, I mean, we have predictive values, but we're still um, waiting for our independent validation to um, see how the real world uh, performance will look like. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dr. Wan. And one final question that we have is: uh, Do you think um, the uh, NGS has a better advantage when it comes to microarrays for the kind of assay that you are developing? Um, sorry, can you? Uh, no, uh, and, uh, uh, ability to use uh, NGS for uh, methylation detection. How advantageous mm -hmm. it is when it compare, compared to uh, assays like microarrays, which can detect the uh, methylation for, for the kind of assay that you're developing. Which one has better advantage, uh, NGS or microarray? Um, I think um, each technology, it will has its own advantage and disadvantage. So um, for DNA methylation, um, because there's lots of um, studies, uh, no matter whether it is basic research or it is um, application, there's a lot. And uh, we um, it is relatively um, well-known um, biomarkers. And we know that uh, uh, for mechanism, so biologically, it makes sense because we know that uh, the DNA methylation the epigenetic changes will happen um, at early stage of tumor, and even some of the uh, case, uh, some of the paper they have published a uh, report showing that um, the methylation marker even can be able to uh, predict um, the cancer incidence uh, like years before it happens. 
So um, biologically, the DNA methylation, I think it holds a quite strong um, scientific basis. And uh, for technology, for technology speaking, I think um, DNA methylation is also a relatively a mature techniques. And uh, we know that um, other than us, I, I think um, other uh, companies, they also been able to develop a, a platform that with a satisfactory uh, detection sensitivity. So in terms of um, a real world application, I think um, the DNA methylation uh, test um, the NGS has, um, it would be sufficient to satisfy the clinical needs, uh, for example, for multi-cancer detection. Uh, as you said, um, well, my Quran is, I know that um, there's lots of um, basic research going on and new discoveries uh, keep coming up, but um, it, I, I think it, it is still uh, needed uh, a lot of uh, clinical validation to make sure uh, one any one of it and can eventually transfer into a real product for the clinical usage. Uh, um, uh, not uh, so no, I, Yeah, I think the, the question was microarray versus uh, NGS, uh, Dr. Wan. It's not microRNA, so pardon my uh, pronunciation up there. I think we have lost uh, Dr. Ruan's uh, connection, I guess. But anyway, uh, thank, thanks, thanks, Dr. Ruan, for uh, the uh, answering all the questions uh, up there. Um, so if you have any questions, further questions, please do send us through the question answers. We'll try to get them uh, back to you uh, after talking with the speakers. So I think we have reached the conclusion of today's webinar, and I extend my uh, you know sincere gratitude to all the distinguished speakers out there, and sincerely appreciate all of you for being part of this session. Uh, yeah. um, we trust that you have found the webinar insightful and valuable, and as your feedback holds a significant uh, you know importance for us, so that we can continuously improve our um, you know. Uh, presence and enhance our future to students, please do take a few moments to complete the you know, brief feedback that we'll be uh, providing you once the uh, seminar has ended. And if you have any questions uh, regarding Twist products, or if you need you know, uh, for us to answer any questions related to the webinar, or if you want to put us in touch with the speaker, please do contact us at twistbyscience.com, visit twistbyscience.com and send us uh, the questions and requests to your local sales representative, and we'll be get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day and rest of the week ahead. Thank you.